Preach the Word Worldwide Network presents Point of Defense with apologist, theologian, and Bible teacher, Reverend John Crawford. Hello, and welcome to Point of Defense. I'm Reverend John Crawford, your host, and I'm very excited to have my very special guest, Mr. Steve Gregg, is with us, and uh, he is uh, a lifelong Bible teacher. He engages in several debates with uh, various theological topics. He's the former uh, founder of the Great Commission School in McMinnville, Oregon, and he also has a youth ministry uh, as well uh, that he's involved with. It's uh, Youth with a Mission. He's the author of several books, and you're going to want to get familiar with him. And I was telling him before the broadcast here that I used his textbook when I was back in the Bible college at Southeastern Seminary, the four views in the book of Revelation. And that was really uh, an awesome text uh, to use for that class. So, Steve, welcome to Point of Defense. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be with you. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. And tonight we're going to discuss one of my favorite subjects, and uh, I'm sure uh, yours as well, Calvinism. So as we get started, why don't you just tell our viewers what just a brief overlay What is Calvinism? Well, Calvinism is a system of theology that arose uh, in the fourth century uh, through a man named Augustine. Uh, Prior to this time, it was unknown in in mainstream Christianity. It was actually some of the ideas of Calvinism were known uh, through Manichaeanism, which was a, a heresy. And Augustine, before he was a Christian, was a Manichaean. And then he became a Christian and became a very influential philosopher and and a teacher and theologian, and eventually uh, the entire Latin church, the Roman Catholic Church, followed Augustine, and even the Reformers did. Some people say Augustine was the founder both of the Roman Catholic Church and of the Protestant Reformation. His views uh, differed from earlier views in its uh, in the way he understood the sovereignty of God. Now, the sovereignty of God refers to God being in authority over all things, but Augustine, like the Manichaeans before him, believe that God's sovereignty meant that God actually, I was going to say micromanages, and some some Calvinists might object to that term, but uh, that he's, uh, that all things that happen are through his sovereign providence, that he essentially has ordained everything that will happen, and, and in, in a sense guarantees that it will happen through his uh, meticulous providence. The main controversy there is that he applies this principle even to the area of conversion and and non-conversion, that everything that happens, God determined before the foundation of the world. And that would mean that if I became a Christian, it's because God determined that I would. On the other hand, if I don't become a Christian, it's because he determined that I wouldn't. Uh, that, that anything that sounds like free will, like I made a choice to be a Christian or I made a choice to reject Christ, they would say, well, that's, <clears throat> that's only the appearance of free will on our part because behind the choices we make, behind everything that happens is God's ordained uh, providence. And therefore, he guaranteed that a certain number of people will be saved, and he knows their names. They're, he's got a list of them. Basically, the idea is that the, the number of the elect or the chosen ones that God has chosen for salvation, is a, a set amount from the foundation of the world that you cannot add to the list or take away from the list. So everyone, you know, I mean, they don't go into this part so much, but basically one of the aspects of this is that everybody before they were born uh, either was predetermined to become a Christian or not to, and you can't do anything other than what was predetermined. So uh, there are people who will be in, uh, you know, saved, who really didn't have the choice of whether they'd be saved or not. I mean, they seem to, they make choices in their life, but they only made the choices that God ordained for them to make. And therefore they were born to inevitably be saved and could not change that destiny because God is sovereign and they are not. Likewise, a person who goes to hell, someone who doesn't get saved, uh, that really wasn't their choice either. That was determined before they were born. They made, it, they made choices in the course of their life, but again, these choices were ordained by God so that they were, in a real sense, they were born incapable of being saved. They were born uh, without any option of being saved. And yet God punishes them, they say, <clears throat> forever and ever uh, because they didn't get saved when it was really God's decision that they would not get saved, not their own. Uh, now, when I said not their own, the Calvinists said, no, they made that decision too. But a true Calvinist will have to say they made that decision because God ordained that they would make that decision. So it was beforehand. God 
was the one who determined they wouldn't get saved. In the course of running through their lives, as God ordained them to do this and that and the other thing, among the things they did was reject Christ. So they did reject Christ on their own, but they they had no other option. They could not receive him because they were not among the elect. This is a view that uh, the early church, of course, for the first three and a half hundred years, would never have in, embraced, and which I don't believe the Bible embraces. Right, and, and there are many contradictions and logical fallacies found within that systematic, as you mentioned, uh, we'll talk, we'll just, for example, take the great white throne judgment, revelation chapter 20, God is judging those people because their names have not been found in the Lamb's book of life, judges them for their works for something that they didn't have anything to do with. That's totally contradictory. Why would God waste his time making a judgment for someone and condemning them or pronouncing them condemned because they didn't have a choice. If it's his choice, why would he even judge them? Yeah, well, the Calvinists would say, when we say, well, they didn't have anything to do with it, they'd say, oh, not that's not how we see it. They would say, well, they had something to do with it, but they weren't the ultimate arbiter of whether they did it or not. I mean, they, they would say that the unbeliever is living out his sinful hatred for God, that he's totally depraved and hates God, and uh, if God doesn't stop him, all he can do is hate God. And therefore, the, the, the unbeliever deserves to go to hell because they have hated God. But again, if you go back you know, th consistently through the Calvinist idea, the reason they hated God is because God ordained that they'd hate God. And, and they cannot do anything other than what God ordained. Which is totally, it's contradictory. It doesn't make any sense. They say that's a mystery. That's what Calvin would say. I mean, in both cases, they say, well, if indeed God has ordained everything we do, how can he hold us responsible for it? I mean, that's the very question you and I would ask them. You know, how can yeah. God hold a person responsible if they had no choice? And they, and both Calvin and uh, Luther would have said, oh, it's just, it's a great mystery. Well, it's not a mystery. It's, uh, it, frankly, I mean, there are such things as mysteries. There's, I'm sure, in the Trinity doctrine, there's some true mystery there. So, but the Trinity doctrine is not nonsense. When you say, uh, you know, God made this to be a circle, but it's really a, but, and it's also a square, you've said something that's nonsense. To say that God, uh, determined that you would inevitably do some, uh, certain things, before, and he determined this before you were born, and you couldn't do otherwise than what he ordained, and yet you're responsible for it. That's nonsense, because the word, very word responsibility means you, you're able to make a response. Yeah, you're responsible. Response. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So to say, well, you didn't, the person really didn't have the ability to make a response other than what God ordained, but they're still responsible. No, I mean, that's just, that's gobbledygook. That's just, uh, that's using words that don't don't make sense together. I want to look at some quotes now, Steve, and, and get your uh, opinion on these. Now, uh, most Calvinists, at least most, maybe not all, but most of them would believe and teach and do that Calvinism is the gospel. If it's not Calvinism, it's not the gospel. Now, let's look at some quotes here. Uh, this is a quote from Spurgeon. There's no such thing as preaching Christ and him crucified unless you preach what is called Calvinism. Calvinism is the gospel and nothing else. What do you think about that? Well, Spurgeon had some blind spots. One of them was his Calvinism. He thought Arminianism was from the pit of hell. And, uh, you know, Spurgeon was a great preacher, but when he got onto this subject, he, he was basically a, uh, a partisan uh, in, a, in a controversy. Uh, to say that Calvinism is itself the gospel is to insist that nobody preached the gospel before Augustine because no right. Christian teacher ever taught Calvinist doctrines until the late fourth century. And that would mean that, you know, nobody that, that was trained by the apostles or that was trained by the, uh, the ones who were trained by the apostles, none of the early church people in the generations after the apostles knew what the gospel was because they, they actually, whenever they encountered what we would call Calvinist doctrines, they didn't call them that because Calvin hadn't lived yet, so they didn't call it Calvinism. Right. But they were, they encountered it in a heresy called Manichaeanism, and they, they did know these ideas. They knew of these ideas, but they rejected them. They, they knew they were not Christian. So yeah, in rejecting the Calvinist views, the early church fathers, according to Spurgeon, would be not preaching the gospel. And so we'd have to believe that nobody preached the gospel for the first 300 years or three and a half, a hundred years. Uh, also, of course, uh, a great number of people who have been saved have been saved under Arminian or non-Calvinist non preachers. I mean, Wesley was uh, not a Calvinist, and he's one of the greatest revivalists uh, that ever uh, lived. Frankly, there were yeah. others, uh, 
close to it. But, but the, I mean, t- to say that the people who got saved under Wesley's preaching, uh, really, they'd never heard the gospel because they didn't preach Calvinism. Uh, therefore, they weren't saved. That's a, it's an absurdity. I mean, the, the fruit of being a Christian is not in your theological sophistication. The, the fruit of being a Christian is that you love one another, that you live a holy and obedient life to God in Christ, and he's your Lord and Savior. But Jesus never preached Calvinism, and no. Paul never preached Calvinism. Now, of course, that's a controversial thing to say, because there are things in the teaching of Jesus and of Paul which the Calvinists use as proof texts, mm. but they have to do so by taking them out of context. Right. Uh, the whole context of Scripture is that God did not ordain everything that happens. He He is sovereign. But see, the point is, to be sovereign doesn't mean that you micromanage things. Being sovereign just means, the word itself means you have the authority to do what you want. You don't answer right. to anybody. So so if, I, if I'm a king and I'm the sovereign in my nation, that means I can make the decisions and no one, I don't have to answer to anybody. But it doesn't tell you whether I'm going to micromanage people's lives or not. As a king, I might want to give people a lot of freedom. Yeah. Uh, that's my choice as a sovereign, you know, or yeah. I might want to be a tyrant. I might want to micromanage everything and not give people any freedom. That's, that's within the range of options for a sovereign. But to say that somebody is a sovereign does not mean they're a tyrant. It doesn't mean that they don't give free will because a, a father who's the sovereign of his home uh, over his children he might, uh, he might have their whole day scheduled out from the time they wake up till the time they go to bed, and they have to do every single thing he said. Uh, he has, I guess, the right to do that, but most fathers don't do that. Most fathers yeah. think it's a good thing for children to make some choices and to have responsibility and learn lessons. God gave humans responsibility, which involves free choice. So, I mean, to be a sovereign doesn't tell you whether that person is providentially making everything happen and deciding everything. A sovereign may actually take some delight in letting his subjects make their own choices about who they're going to marry, what they're going to have for dinner, you know, when they're going to get up in the morning, what job they're going to have. Yeah. That's, that's, that, that doesn't compromise a sovereign's sovereignty. So Calvinism just doesn't really, I mean, they define words the way they want to, and that's, they win the debate by defining the terms. But you can't, you, you're really not allowed to do that. You have to use terms to mean what they mean. And that's why they can say, you know, that's why when they say, well, God ordains everything, but people are still responsible. Well, you're not really allowed to make new definitions of the word responsible. Responsible means no. that you had the ability to make one response or another. And, uh, you know, you can use the word in a totally unauthorized way. And that's the only way you'll win your debate, you know. But if right. you use words to mean what they mean, you can't win those arguments. Right. And then you think about all the people that get saved today that have never heard of Calvinism. People around the world in foreign countries that got saved when they heard the simple gospel message, which is Jesus Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and he's God's son. You need eternal life. That's the gospel in a nutshell. And so there's nothing about Calvinism indicated in that verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, or Romans 1, 16, the definition of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. Right. There's nothing distinctly Calvinistic about those statements in the gospel. And many no. people have gotten saved from hearing those statements and have mm-hmm. never heard a theological treatise on limited atonement or <laughs> irresistible grace or yeah. perseverance of the saints or some of those Calvinist points. So you can be a great Christian without having much theological sophistication. Sure. You know, sure. The, the guy, the, the, the blind man who Jesus healed on the Sabbath and he was criticized for it. Uh, the man was not sophisticated and he just said, I don't know. You know, you critics are saying Jesus is a sinful man. I don't even know that much about him. All I know is I was blind and now I see, you right. know, he didn't have any, he couldn't explain theology, but he had an encounter with Jesus and he was loyal to him. And that's really what become. That's how a person becomes a Christian is by encountering Jesus. It would take a fair amount of uh, theological sophistication for someone to be able to enunciate the Calvinist doctrines and uh, and the arguments for them. Because frankly, <laughs> you're you're kind of beating your head against the wall if you're trying to make sense of it, uh, because it's not sensible. But no. if you had to believe it, even so, a new convert could hardly be expected to believe such things. They'd, if they're true, they'd have to be learned. And so being a Christian doesn't mean your theology is all straight. It means right. you, you're a follower of Jesus. Let's check out uh, another quote here, Steve, from B.B. Warfield. Calvinism is just Christianity, nothing more or less 
than the hope of the world. Now, again, we can see that that obviously is no hope. If that yeah. is, if Calvinism is Christianity, then there's going to be a lot of people that are that have never truly even been born again. That is the amazing thing, because it, I mean that any Calvinist could say that his view is the hope of the world. I mean, it just contradicts his own doctrine. It's in, if Calvinism is true, that's the hope of the few who are called the elect. There's no hope right. for the rest of the world. See, if Calvinism is not true, then there really is hope for just anybody who may choose to come to Christ and be a follower, a, a believer. You know, non-Calvinism really does extend hope to the world, but the Calvinist view is that Jesus didn't even die for the whole world. He only died for the elect. Limited so, to the tone. Mm -hmm. How is that hope for the world? It's, a, it's, a, it's an absurdity to say that. And as far as, you know, any assurance of salvation, I've always thought that Calvinism denies a person assurance of salvation because Calvinism teaches that if you're not elect, you may appear to be elect nonetheless for some time. You may actually live like a Christian for some period of time. But if you don't persevere living like a Christian to the very end, then you never were a Christian. You were never the elect because part of the doctrine is unconditional election. The other part is perseverance of the saints. Perseverance of the saints means that if you're one of the elect, you will not only believe, but you'll believe for the rest of your life. You'll believe until you die. You'll persevere in your faith and your Christianity. Right. Whereas when you find cases, and there are numerous cases, of people who seem to be wonderful Christians for years, even decades, but then they lost their faith, or on their deathbed, they they renounced Christianity. There are people like that. They would have to say that those people, although they seemed like great Christians for a long time, weren't. They weren't Christians at all, because the way you die, uh, that is, if you're in the faith when you die or you're not, determines whether you were ever saved or not. Right, right. And what that means is that you and I might live uh, as Christians very convincingly. And we might have the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We might love God. We might be genuine worshipers of God. But, but if we happen to backslide, then we were never saved at this point. I believe people do backslide sometimes. You know, they, they would actually, the only way you'd really know if you're one of the elect in Calvinism is if you are on your deathbed and you're breathing your last breath and you have not fallen away. You know, because if you fell away at that last breath, it would show you never were a Christian at all in their system. Which exactly. Is and that's a contradiction. That's a contradiction too, Steve, because if God has decreed or predetermined everything from the beginning to the end, as they teach, then that's a, there's a major problem with that because if he's determined for me to be saved, then would he not also predetermine for me to persevere in good works and no choice of my own? That is what they believe, but they, but they believe that, that proves that if you didn't persevere, then you weren't saved anyway, because the same God who would elect you would cause you to persevere. And also we could say uh, another thought about this gospel and, and being compared to Calvinism. How could we stand up to, uh, to a group of people at church or if we're on the street talking to people or even to an individual, Steve, how could we say Jesus Christ died for you? After all, if the elect have already been determined, ever who's going to be saved is going to be saved, and they're already predestined. Me sharing the gospel doesn't have any bearing on it. And I know there are some Calvinists that do believe in sharing the gospel, okay? But they'll mm -hmm. tell you Christ commanded it. Well, why would Christ command it to tell every sinner, and only some of those sinners are part of these part of this special elect group? That does not that does not uh, make any sense whatsoever. It's not the gospel. That there's no gospel in Calvinism. Yeah, they, they would say, well, you don't know which ones are elect. That's why you have to preach to everybody. But God knows who the elect are, and, and that's how he's going to save them. But, I mean, you're right. You can't really tell an unbeliever or even a Christian that Jesus loves them or died for them. Because Calvinism doesn't teach that God, Jesus loves or died for anyone but the elect. And even if you seem to be a Christian, you might not be one of the elect. That remains to be seen by whether you persevere or not. So you couldn't really talk to, in a counseling session, you couldn't tell somebody that Jesus is on their side, that Jesus loves them, that Jesus died for them, because that's simply right. not what Calvinism teaches. If, they, if you're a Calvinist, you can't do that. I right. actually brought that up to uh, uh, James White when I was debating him on my radio show. I said... Uh, you know, if actually, actually, you know what? It was not on that show. It was when he was listening 
and critique, listening to and critiquing some of my lectures on Calvinism on his show, I had said something like, well, if Calvinism is true, you can't tell any sinner that Jesus died for them because you don't know if they're the elect, maybe he didn't. And, and James White said, that's right. We can't tell anyone that Jesus died for them. We can only. Oh, tell he them. he admitted to that. He admitted that. He admitted that. Yeah, he says because we don't because we don't know. And I've known very few Calvinists wow. that admit that. I had a I had a Calvinist pastor friend when I lived in Idaho. He was a fully Calvinist, but he's a good friend pastor of mine. And uh, and he said, very. He's the only Calvinist I've ever known that said. He says, yeah. He says I can't really know for sure if I'm saved because I haven't persevered yet. But I mean, he believed he was saved, but he wasn't sure because in his own system. You can't really know if God loves you and if you're saved, if Jesus died for you until you die and you're faithful. And then you've you've passed the test and you now know you're one of the elect. But short of that, you live your whole life without knowing. Most Calvinists assume they're part of the elect, but they, they don't have any better for, reason for assuming that than any other person has because they don't know if they're going to persevere. And so, therefore, here we go again. If they can't be sure of their own salvation, how can they tell others? You can be sure, come and get saved, but, well, you can't really be sure. So but go ahead and try it anyway. And if you don't persevere, you probably won't make it. I mean, how is that the gospel, Steve? It's not. It's clearly no, not the gospel. It's not the gospel. No, it's not. There's no gospel in Calvinism to say that God, uh, they have. They do everything in twos. There's a, you know, a general call, a specific call to the lost. And why well, give a general call if there's only a specific set that's supposed to be right. saved? you got two kinds of love. Two wheels, uh, two wheels. Two wheels. I mean, all these different sets of twos, and it's like that's just totally contradictory to what the scriptures teach. I believe, right. but they have yeah. to have that kind of uh, device. They have to say there's two wills in God because the Bible says it's God's will that all should be saved. The Bible says it's God's will that we all be holy and not fornicate. Well, some people do fornicate. Some people aren't holy. Some people don't get saved. And yet that would mean things are going against God's will. And yet they believe that God's will, his sovereign will is always done. So they'd say, well, his sovereign will is never uh, violated, but his, you know, they have some other word for the will that. Permissive will or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, they, I mean, they have to have two different wills of God because they say his, there's one will of God that's always done his sovereign will. But uh, there, but but you can do things that he didn't want you to do. Well, then how did, I mean, they just, they're talking out of both sides of their mouths in many cases. Uh, and there's no point, Steve, in also praying about anything. I shouldn't pray for my lost uh, family member or my boss or my coworker or my neighbor across the street, because after all, it's been decreed and predetermined. So I could be praying against God's will. Of course, now Calvinists would probably say, well, he's decreed it. But then again, why pray though? Yeah. Well, what they would say, what they would say is that God has not only ordained the ends, but he's ordained them. So they say God has ordained who will be saved, but he's also ordained that they'll get saved because you prayed for them or because you witnessed to them or because a, a certain circumstance that appears to bring them to Christ. You know, he, he ordained that that would happen, too. It's a slippery, a slippery thing. I mean, they can it say is. those because that's the only way they can make their system work. And here's, here's another problem I see. And you'll, you, I'm sure you'll agree with this. They're, they're so sure of the five points, the doctrines of grace, the tulip T U L I P. They're so sure of that. But when you ask them, what criteria does God, the father choose certain sinners to be elect and others to be damned? If they believe in active double yeah. predestination or the same way with passive, he passes over others, lets them go to hell, right. but he chooses only the elect. But either way, you still got a problem with that too. Yeah, they, they say that God doesn't see anything in one person that causes him to save them, uh, as opposed to what he would see in someone else who uh, doesn't cause, cause him not to save them. He, they believe that everyone is exactly alike, a hater of God, and only God, by unilaterally changing that, can save some of them. And he could do it to everybody if he wants to. He just doesn't want to. You know, this is, it makes God arbitrary. Now, they would say, well, it's not arbitrary. That's uh, That's human wisdom talking. And say that God has purposes, has has reasons. He just hasn't let us know what they are. That you know, he the reason he chooses this person, not one, is because of the sovereign purpose of his will. But really, the truth is, if that's how God operates, he doesn't love the world. If that doctrine is true, that the Bible could say that God is love. How is God love? 
if he only really loves the elect enough to save them right. and everyone else, which is the majority of the people on the planet, he did not save when he could have. It looks like we're almost out of time. I know this time is really flown by fast. Thank you so much for coming on the program. I hope you'll come back again and uh, chat with us again about uh, this topic. Go ahead, go ahead and give your website. And um, also, I, I failed to mention, you also host a radio program called The Narrow Path. Uh, where can people find out uh, how to listen to that? It's on your website, correct? That's the, website. the website is actually thenarrowpath.com. My show is on daily, Monday through Friday for an hour, and it's live. People call in with Bible questions and we discuss them. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming, and I hope you come back and see us again soon. Thank you very much, and I will see you on the next video. Okay, John. God bless you. All right. Hey, Steve, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Support this ministry through PayPal on our YouTube page. See you on the next show.